Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, good morning and welcome to church. I hope everybody here is just having a wonderful, wonderful day so far. And to ensure that we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this place, Lord. I thank you so much that we get to come together, we get to gather, Lord, and we get to learn about you, Lord. We get to proclaim your glory, Lord, in this house. Lord, I just, I thank you for this season, Lord, and I thank you for the reason of this season, Lord. I just thank you that we can all gather together here as one, Lord, as a group of believers, and just put our faith and our trust in you. Father, I'm just, I just ask that you take anything in our lives, Lord, anything in our lives, and just any distractions, any, any hurdles, anything that's in our way right now, Lord, I just pray that you just remove them, Lord, and let this message, Lord, let this message sink into the souls of those in this house, Lord, let, it, let us just, let this message encourage us, let this message challenge us, Lord. Let us just be changed leaving here today. Father, you are so good, and I just pray that you move as only you can in this room today. Amen. 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 Well, I love hearing from kids. I love hearing from kids. That's so good. That's so good. So I have a question. Kathy kind of kind of hinted at it a little bit earlier. How many of you are winter ready? You know what I mean? Like, we haven't had snow for a while yet, but I'm still kind of dragging my feet. So to be honest, the last couple of weeks in our house, what's been going on is that we've been slowly getting ready for the change of seasons. We've been slowly getting ready and dragging our feet, like I said. Now for me, for me, that means I'm cleaning and organizing and decluttering my closet. So I'm getting rid of all my summer clothes, all my, all my shorts, all my nice summer clothes, golf shirts, you know, having a good cry, putting that stuff away until it, it's nice out again. And I'm doing all this stuff and then, and then I get to clean out the garage and get rid of all the, all the scooters and all the bikes and all the helmets and everything and just get ready for changing over tires and keeping the truck warm and all that kind of stuff. Now for my wife, she's doing very much the same. She's changing over her wardrobe and her closet and the wardrobe in the kids' closets, as you saw today. We still got sneakers, I guess, no boots. But anyway, so we'll handle that. But she's changing over the wardrobes of the kids. My wife has also been doing something else the last couple of weeks and she's been trying to be sneaky about it, but I'm on to her. Don't tell her. For the last couple of weeks, every day, when I come home, a little bit of the home decor changes. Every day. The first day I looked and there my, on my couch cushions in the living room, it's no longer the regular couch cushions, it's now the Christmas festive ones. And I went, okay, noted. The next day I come home from work and there's a festive, beautiful Christmas table runner on the kitchen table and I went, okay, that's a little bolder. Next day I come home, the mistletoe is in the roof in a new position for the year. And I went, well, I'll, I'll take that, I guess. So I, I tested it out. It works great. Awesome. So I'll be waiting there later. Um, so it works great. And I come home from men's group last week and I just laughed. Actually, two weeks ago, I come home from men's group and I look out and I just laugh and the Christmas tree's up and the lights are on, and I went, well, she did it while I was out of the house. She was doing these changes, they were small changes, little, little, little changes, bit by bit, not to draw attention to it, but I was noticing for the last couple of weeks that the seasons were changing. I was able to see that the seasons were changing. Wow. The title of the message the Lord has put on my heart today is In and Out of Season. In and Out of Season. Well, now as I was cleaning my closet, and going through the things that seemed to pile up, I found some things in my closet. I found, look, I'm wearing one right now. I found bracelets that my little girls had made for me. I found just pictures that they drew for me. I found a, a, a birthday card and an anniversary card for my loving wife. I found these things, and as I'm in my closet, and I'm looking at these things, I just, I found myself in my closet just, just really thanking the Lord. Really thanking the Lord. I was thinking about the memories tied to these things. And I found myself just, I found myself just really thanking the Lord in my closet and just thank you for all the blessings in my life, Lord. I was remembering those moments when the girl said, Daddy, I made this for you. Do you like it? I was remembering that. And it's so, so very important that we take time and we remember. So important. So important. The root of the word remember means to keep in mind to be mindful of. It has a sense of being, uh, it has a sense of being concerned about. Concerned about. To bear in mind and to recollect. Remember also means to think of and recall a memory with some kind of intention. With an intention. Hmm. The word remember is used 352 times in the Bible. And if you, if you take into account other variations of the word, that jumps up to 550 times in the Bible. God must want us to remember. 
must be very important for us to remember. In the days of the Old Testament, God instructed his people to build stone memorials, an altar of remembrance to permanently, permanently mark a place where God had just manifested his power, manifested his covenant, and where he, where he just manifested his promises. Basically a place wherever he showed up in a big way, they would build an altar there, an altar of remembrance. And we see many examples of this in Scripture, and I just want you guys to bear with me a little bit this morning, church. I'm going to go over four of them, and it's for good reason that I'm doing this. So the first one I want to go over is Moses. After meeting with God and receiving the, the, and recording the laws and the covenants in Exodus 24, verses 3 to 4, it says, He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of a mountain, and he set up 12 stone pillars representing 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent out young Israelite men, and they offered sacrifices as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Something happened, and he built an altar for it. He built an altar for it. Another one I want to go over is Jacob in Genesis 28. Jacob left by himself on a journey. He was actually headed to Haran. And he stopped for the night, and he laid his head down. And there at that night, he had a dream. And in that dream, it's Jacob's ladder, and he saw the angels ascending and descending on that ladder. Ooh, it was powerful. I know you guys know some of that story. And in that dream, the Lord appeared to Jacob and said, The land that you're in right now, you will possess. And the Lord also told him that his descendants would be many and his descendants would be blessed. So we read in Genesis 18, 18 to 22, or sorry, 28, 18 to 22, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? There's no, uh, this is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took a stone that he had placed under his head and set it up, set up a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city was originally called Luz. And he said, wow, if he, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I will return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give you one-tenth. That was powerful. Nobody else was around. He could have just, he could have just gone about his day and said, wow, that was cool. He intentionally, he was intentional, intentional. You talked about intentionality today. I'm talking about that too. Uh, one of my, there, I get, my last two are my favorite ones. Joshua and Joshua 4. Joshua was leading the Israelites across the Jordan River to go do battle in Jericho. And the river was at flood stage of the season. It was just dangerously high, very high moving, swiftly moving. And as the Ark of the Covenant was carried onto it, God stopped the flow of the water. He stacked it up like a wall. And then 40,000 soldiers and the entire Israelite nation crossed over this river. That's, that's 2,000, sorry, 2 million people. That's around 2 million people crossed over the water and it stood suspended. So God told Joshua to choose 12 men, one from each tribe, to gather a stone, one from each tribe, and to build a memorial with these 12 stones. And scripture says in Joshua 4, 6, to serve as a sign among you in the future. When your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. And scripture says those stones are still there today. And even modern archaeologists have covered them and found them. And you can see them. You can Google it. You can Google this today. It's so awesome. It's so awesome. But it was because intentionally somebody took time to build an altar for what the Lord has done. Built an altar. It's dry in here. Mm -hmm. So, this one is my favorite. This one is my favorite, and it's, and it's because of the big, great misunderstanding that it was. In Joshua 22, the people of Israel were broken up into 12 different tribes, and each one of the tribes had something different that they were responsible for. One tribe was strictly responsible for the altar. So if you, had to, if you wanted to give to the Lord, if you wanted to give sacrifices, if you wanted to, to give to the Lord, you had to go to their piece of land to give to the Lord. So what happens is, is this other tribe builds a fake altar. 
builds a, builds an altar, and it's not that it's not the right altar. But everyone else, all the other tribes, are looking at this, and they see that they built an altar. They were not okay with it. They were not cool with it, and they said, "What? What are they doing?" Why are they defying God this way? Why, why would they build an altar? They know that we have been instructed to, to look after the altar, but why would they do this? Why would they defy God in this way? So they were so mad, and they said, you know what? Let's go to war against them. Let's go to war against them. But before they went to war against them, they decided, let's send over our priest and our chief men to the other side to see. They asked, why? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? So... They got over to the other side in Joshua 22, 23 to 27, and they asked them about this altar. And this is what they responded. If we have built our own altar to turn away from the Lord and offer burnt offerings, grain offerings, sacrifices, and fellowship offerings on it, may the Lord himself call us into account. No, we did it for fear. For someday your descendants might say to ours, what do you have to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? The Lord made the Jordan a boundary between us, you, you Reubenites and Gadites. You have no share in the Lord. So your descendants might cause ours to stop fearing the Lord. And that's why we said, let us get ready to build an altar. Not, not for burnt sacrifices and offerings, but on the contrary, this altar is to be a witness. This altar is to be a witness between us and you and all the generations that follow that we will worship the Lord at his sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and fellowship offerings. Then the, you're, in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share in the Lord. They built the entire altar, a replica altar. If you guys, my parents didn't have a lot of money growing up. I had the shoes with the backwards Nike checks, you know, like the, the imposter ones. This was an imposter altar. This wasn't the real thing. So, but they built it just as a witness to say, yeah, we're, we're part of all that. We believe too. We believe too. We're going to do the same things. We believe too. So as I was reading these scriptures and preparing for this message, I thought, so why why always a stone altar? Why always a stone altar? And then, figure, obviously, it's easy. Because they outlive the person who builds them. Stone altars outlive the person who builds them. The circumstances may change. Years will come and go. People, people's lives will end. People die. But, but, the altar of remembrance will remain forever. It will remain as a memorial to a divine occurrence. It will stand for something. Church, similarly, what you build in your life as an altar of remembrance to your God will stand for something. It will stand for something. It will last. It will stand for generations. So why is it so important to God that we would remember with intentionality? There's that word again, Jen. That's the word of the day, intentionality. Our world, look around. It's not so hard for us to figure out. It's not hard. Our world... And the current culture, they bombard us. They, it bombards us with noise and images that can slip us up. It can potentially, the, the, everything out there can potentially drown out his voice. And it, that's dangerous. The, we need to understand right here, right now in this moment, that's dangerous. When we go out there, it could potentially slip us up and we could, oh, we can even potentially drown out his voice or the realization of his goodness. We get busy. Jen talked about our routines this morning, and we, talk, we talked about just because it's complacency. So sometimes we get busy, or sometimes we even get comfortable with our complacency. That's dangerous. We have to watch for that. So if we get busy or comfortable in our complacency, then the enemy of our soul, the father of lies, Satan, tries to tell us everything bad about God, that he's not with us that he doesn't have the best interest in mind for you, that he's not faithful. The enemy will try to tell us that if we let all this noise come at us. And it's so, so, so important that we just, uh, we, we stop that and we build altars of remembrance to the Lord. Somehow over time when we get a new issue or a new problem arises in our life, we may even get confused and bombarded or possibly even lack the faith in the moment or the, or the truth in the moment to know that God has come through for us in the past and that he will do it again. We need to build altars. I'm going to jog your memory a little bit here, church. Do you guys remember? There she is sitting in the back row. Do you guys remember? She's hard of hearing. Do you guys remember when Leah 
<laughs> you guys remember a couple of weeks ago when Leah preached a fantastic word? You guys remember that? Leah, in her word, asked us, some, asked us to ask ourselves some very, very important questions. Very, very important questions. She said, in her word, she said, she asked us to ask ourselves, what can I do? What can I do? With everything going on in the world right now and everything that we're seeing out there, she asked us to say, what can we do? If the Lord asked us, if the Lord said, hey, I've given you something. I've given you something so that you can prepare a way for me to move in somebody else's life. And Leah said, what can we do? What can we do? What do we have? What do we have available to us? How can we help? What can I do? And ever since you preached that, I was just like, ugh. Every day I'm like, I'm not doing enough. I'm simply not doing enough. What more? What more can I do? I need to do something more. We all do. So church, what, what is a resource that each and every one of you have that you can use that can prepare a way for the Lord? What's a resource? I'll tell you this, I've preached about it before, and as long as I'm able to come up here and have a mic in my hand, I will preach about this continually, because it is so important. That resource is, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Church, your story your story is the resource that each and every one of you have available to you. It costs you nothing. And each one of you have one. And it is so important. And that's a way that we can prepare a way for the Lord. We can prepare a way for the Lord with our story. And it's so important. See, oh my goodness, when you share your story about Jesus and what he's doing in your life, when you make that personal, it changes the environment. It changes the atmosphere in that moment. It changes things. It, it, it's so powerful. It's so powerful. See, because when you tell your story of what Jesus has done and doing right now in your life, it changes the perspective on the conversation. You bridge a gap from knowing about him to knowing him. You bridge a gap. And people, people may not be able to understand. They say, wow, well, I mean, I read the Bible four times, and I know this, and I know that. And people will try to bicker doctrine. People will try to bicker different, different Bible verses. People will try to pick it apart and nitpick it. But they can't pick apart your story because that's your story. That's your, that's your independent action that happened with the Lord. That's your relationship. People can't pick that apart. People can't pick that apart. How come women are preaching in church? They're not like, come on. No, this is what happened to me in my life. This is what happened. It's so important. It's so important. You're sharing your own personal story with a God, a living, active God who's alive and at work in your life right now. And there is so much power with sharing your story. Now, because it's so easy for us to get distracted or worn out or dull of hearing at times and even low on faith, we need to remember what God has done in our lives. We need to remember what God has done in our lives, or guess what? We will forget it. We will forget it. Whether you write it down or speak it, share your story. Proclaim, proclaim, proclaim the goodness and miraculous works of God. 2 Timothy 4.2, the Apostle Paul writes to encourage his protege. He says, I give you this charge. Preach the word be prepared in and out of season to correct, rebuke, and encourage. And encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Church, what about us today? What about us today? So, like Timothy, we are commanded to always be ready for the Lord's work. Always be ready in and out of season for the Lord's work. So, for Timothy, we'd say... That's the thing. We can't just come to work, sorry, come to a church, clock into our faith. And then we're at church. Do you guys see any time tickets, any time cards on the door on the way out? No. And then we clock out and don't think, only think that we represent Jesus here at the church. But we think we maybe don't represent him out there during the week. That's the, that wasn't an option for Timothy and that's not an option for each and every one of you. That's not an option for any of us. We have to be ready. We have to be ready. If we are a Christian, 1 Peter 2.9 tells us, you are a chosen people. 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. He called you out of darkness. Talk about it. Tell that story. Share that story. He's working in your life. He's alive and active in your life. And we need to share that. We need to share that. So no matter what we're doing, where we are, we need to be ready in and out of season to declare his power, his truth, and his glory to a watching and a wondering world. We need to. So the question I have is, are we building our altars? Are we building our altars? The past few weeks, Jen has talked about, talked about it this morning. The past few weeks has been so powerful and such a blessing to me in my life. I mean, we've had so many different speakers come through. And I mean, months, like, realistically, Leo, with your, your friend that came up here and gave his testimony, and then you preached. And then it's, it's been powerful on top of powerful. And the Lord is aligning our Wednesday night services. And the message is in them, and he's aligning them to Sunday morning. And you guys... Like Pastor Jim was saying, you really need to come. It's so powerful. God is on the move in a mighty way, in a mighty way. And we need to be here. We need to be ready to just drink it all in, take it all in. It's so powerful. So last Sunday, Jen, Pastor Jen, last Sunday, can I get a, some praise for what the Lord did with Pastor Jen last Sunday? That was crazy good. It was so good, honestly. I was like, I got to preach next week. Oh, my goodness. So it was so good, Jen. It was so good. But here's the thing. It's such a blessing to see what the Lord is doing. And it's so encouraging, encouraging to hear what he's revealing to her in, his li- in, her, in her life right now. He's revealing things to her and she's sharing that stuff with us. And then last Wednesday, Pastor Terry comes up here and oh my goodness, was it powerful. He comes up and he preaches the word and he talks about the ways the Lord has revealed himself to him over the last year, however many years. Not too many years, you're a young buck still, but still, how the Lord has revealed himself and it was so powerful. And the thing is, is you get fired up. You get fired up and all these, all these things that are happening in preaching, you get fired up and you get encouraged and you're like, oh, I want to be a giant killer. I want to be a giant killer. Like, this is awesome. This is awesome. Church, uh, I don't know where I heard it before, but I know I heard it before. We often don't share what's happening, what the Lord is doing in our life because we think that it has to be a big thing. We think that, oh, what he's doing right now, it's not big enough to share. Nobody's going to get much out of it. You have to kind of understand our relationship and no one's really going to understand it. Nothing can be further from the truth. You don't need to have this big giant thing that you have to share with somebody in order for them to understand that the Lord is working in your life. You don't need a giant, giant stone to kill a giant. Ask David. A little stone can kill a giant. A little stone can do it. So don't think that what you're, what's happening in your life right now, don't think that it's not a big enough thing that I need to share. You have to share it. You don't know the ripple effect of a stone that we don't use. You have to use it. Everything, we have to use it. My goodness, I love you guys. So Revelation 12, 11 says, the enemy was defeated by the blood of the lamb and what? The word of their testimony. Church, things happen when we share. Things happen when we share. Faith is built up when we share things. We need to constantly and intentionally be building our altars of remembrance along our paths so that we can encourage others. And here's an important one, so that we don't stray from our own path. We don't stray from our own journey. We, don't, we have the faith in the moment to do what we need to do. It's so important. We can't lose our way of faith because sometimes, like what's happening right now in Alberta, the seasons change. The seasons change. Sometimes we may find ourselves in a different season with different circumstances, coming up against different things. And a place where, where maybe, maybe it's a little bit colder. Maybe, maybe our surroundings are a little bit more harsh. Maybe everything's coming at us in a little bit of a different way. Hmm. Life is not always sunshine and rainbows. That's a truth. Write that down. But, but, we need to prepare for that. We need to prepare for the times when life is not going to be sunshine and rainbows. We need to prepare in a good season for a change of season. We need to always be preparing. We need to always be building our altars of remembrance of what the Lord has done and what the Lord is currently doing in our lives along our path. We can't afford to forget. We can't afford to forget. Oh, my goodness. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. 
always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So we have to always be ready. Always be ready. You know, I just, I got a quick, this is off topic, this is, I got a quick praise report. Last year, the Impactus Conference, we had 24 guys. This year, I bought 33 tickets. <laughs> praise the Lord. That is so good. And in that conference last year, I heard something that rattled me to my baby toes. It says, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now. What's the call? What's the call? It doesn't matter what you feel like in that moment. What's the call? I heard that. I heard that in that. And I, I would have paid as much money as Shannon would have let me pay to go to that conference just to hear that word. Just to hear that sentence. That did it for me. Checked. That's exactly what I needed to hear. How much do we need to hear that in our lives? It doesn't matter. We have all been commissioned. We've all been commissioned. It doesn't matter what we're feeling in that moment. We're supposed to have died to ourselves. It's supposed to be no longer us, but Christ who lives through us. So what is, what is, there's a holdup still. There's always this holdup. And then, oh, let me get back here. So <laughs> I could, oh, this is on my heart. This is in my heart. This message is, oh my goodness. So have you built altars of remembrance in your life that no matter what situation you may find yourselves in, no matter what, you know because you know because you know because you know that the Lord is good. That the Lord is good and you have faith no matter where you are, no matter what you may be up against, no matter what you may be facing. If you don't have that, you need to get that. That's what we're here for. We need to have that kind of thing. No matter what, and no matter what moment, no matter what may be up against us, we have to proclaim his goodness. We need to. We need to. I have a little, little word here. This verse that I'm about to read, oh my goodness. This rattled me. I was preparing for this message, and it cut me. I'm going to talk about this very thing. No matter where you are, no matter where we are, no matter what's going on around us right now, we have to still be able to proclaim. Listen. Matthew 16, 13 to 15, there's a beautiful and powerful moment like this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? I want to pause right there because I'm about to start preaching and it might get, <laughs> might get loud. So now, that is a really good question. And in order for us to further understand this question, I have to do just this much teaching. Just this much. Bear with me. And then I'll, and then I'll start preaching. So get this, Caesarea Philippi was at the foot of Mount Hermon, okay? And that, oh my goodness, it became a religious center for the worship of the Greek god Pan, and so much so that the Greeks named it Panaeus in his honor, okay? It was a city dominated by immoral activities and oh, pagan worship. And at the bottom of this mountain, a spring came up. And to the pagans in the pagan mind, they thought where that spring comes up, they thought that was the gates of hell. They thought that was a portal. They thought that's where their fertility gods lived. So they would do all kinds of unspeakable, gross things to try to summon their fertility gods. And right there, right there beside that spring, right there with all this stuff going on, right there is where Jesus says, right there with all this stuff going on, he says, huh, huh. He asked them, all this stuff is going on, and Jesus asked this weighty, weighty question. He says, a place with many distractions, a place where Jesus himself wasn't well known, a place where the disciples may have been uncomfortable, a place where what you say out loud has consequences. And that's the moment that he chooses to ask them this question. Think about that. Think about that. First he asked, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now that's not a hard question for the disciples to answer. They're just talking about what they hear in passing. Maybe on the street, maybe at the well, maybe wherever. They're just, well, some say, you know, some say Elijah, some say, some say Jeremiah, some say one of the other prophets. And he says, okay. But then he asked, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Wow. So church, what about you? 
What about you? Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? If Jesus himself were standing in front of you, asking you that question, what do you say? What would you say? Would you have the boldness to say what you needed to say? Would you be able to? I would just crumble and cry. <laughs> Did you? Um, so, what would you say in that moment? The answer, this question is such an important question. This, this, this question, who do you say that I am? This question is the most important question in the world. For each and every one of us, it ought to be. It matters more than anything else. Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? That's such, such an important question. And, but today, I want to think about something else with that. Almost just as important of, of how we answer that question is where and when we ask it. Where and when are you asking that question? Who is he? Who do you say that he is? This question is a good question. It demands, this question demands and needs an answer from us. But not just here in a room full of believers. Not just here. Uh-uh. This, this question needs to be answered in a hospital room. Who do you say that he is then? Who do you say that he is in a hospital room? This word, this question needs to be answered not, not only in our homes, but in a funeral home. Who do you say that he is then? Who do you say? This question demands us to answer, not just when life is going good. Church, it is so easy to throw your hands up and amen, glory, hallelujah, when life is going good. It's so easy to praise God. It's so easy. But what about, what about when the seasons change? What about when those things that, the things are coming up against you and it's not the way it used to be and you don't have a flashlight, Brendan. You don't have a flashlight. What about those moments? Those moments and you think, you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know how you're going to make this through this. But you still have to proclaim, who do I say that he is in this moment? Who do I say that he is? <sighs> Simon Peter answered this question with rock-solid faith. And let's look at how Jesus replied in verse 17 and 18. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Wow. I want us to catch something. I want us to catch something here. Because as far as I can tell from my studying for this message, this is the first time that Jesus uses the word church in the Gospels. This is the first time. And I think that's for a reason. Peter's answer becomes the foundation of the church. Jesus promises to build his church on the rock-solid foundation of Peter's faith. So I think Jesus knows that we won't be able to fully confess our faith in him at all times because stuff gets, it gets hard sometimes. And we can't be able to confess that faith without being part of an active, loving, God-chasing church. We need to. We need each other. We need each other in this, especially when storms hit or seasons change. We need each other. We need our fellow believers to keep our faith alive, to be telling our stories to each other. We need that. But here's the part that made me, here's the part that just crushed me. If that's the case for us who believe, how much more does the world need our witness? How much more does the world need our witness? Jesus. We need to get to work, folks. First Peter 2, 4 and 5 says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be holy, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. What did that just tell us? We're living stones. We are living stones. Church, our lives can symbolically become altars of remembrance for the world around us to see a loving, caring, compassionate, mighty, mighty working God. But we have to be intentional. We have to be intentional with it. No one can hear what we're not saying. No one can hear what we're not saying. And guess what? 
My Bible says, I don't see many Bibles. Pastor Kim's Bible says, everybody's Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So what are we saying? What are we saying? We need to be saying something. I know that if I were to pass this mic around right now, if I were to pass it around, almost every single one of you, in fact, I hope every single one of you would have a story, would have a way you'd be able to share something with us, a way the Lord has provided for you in your life. The Lord has guided you through something. The Lord has made you see something. The Lord has, has carried you through a season of your life. You've had this. You all have this story. Each and every one of you have this story. He rescued you. He gave you strength. That's your story. And you have to share it. You have experiences with a mighty, working, powerful God. Share him. Share him. We have to. We have to. We have to. When I think about this, you know, church, each and every one of us has been commissioned. Each and every one of us has been commissioned to go forth and proclaim the gospel. Well, like I said earlier, sometimes when you try to give somebody the Bible through the Bible, sometimes it's not received well because something happened in the past. Maybe somebody tried to ram that Bible down that person's throat and maybe, who knows? We don't know. But the important thing for us to remember is we've all been commissioned and I automatically think of blind Bartimaeus. I think of blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus could not see the miracles that the Lord was doing. Couldn't see anything Jesus was doing. But he heard about them. He heard about them, and when he heard about them, it activated something inside of him. It did something to him when he heard about it. The woman with the issue of the blood, I preached about her. She's one of my favorites. Chad and I have her on the Christmas card list. She's awesome, but get this. She had heard bad news from countless doctors. She went broke going to doctors and trying to get, trying to get some kind of a treatment. She heard gasps and people just judging her whenever she was anywhere. She heard all these things. But you know what else she heard? She heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus and his miracles and all the wonderful signs and wonders that he was performing. And that did something in her. So when blind Bartimaeus heard, something got activated. When the woman with the issue of the blood heard, something got activated. Church, when we share our story about Jesus, do you have any idea how, how powerful that is? And do you have any idea what that does? It impregnates the air around us with faith and hope. And what does our world need right now? Faith and hope. Our world needs this. And each one of you have been commissioned to go out there and share, share your story individually. See, the problem is, is we can no longer be sitting saints I want to commission you all to be stirring saints. you got to stir it up. Hebrews 10.24 from an ESV. That's my favorite verse. Hebrews 10.24 from an ESV says, let us consider how we can stir one another up for love and help one another do good works. So I'm not stirring you up to love someone else. I want to stir you up by my Jesus encounter stories. I want to stir you up to his love. I want to stir you up. I want what I say to you to have so much of an impact that you will go, i got to give this a try. When I'm out there in the world, I want my story to affect somebody, not for Mike's glory, for God's glory. Because, yes, I can read. I can tell you the kids lined up this morning and told us about these Bible stories. But I know that my two kids can tell you stories of how God worked in Daddy's life. And that's powerful. That holds something. Make it personal. We have to make it personal. So... As I'm bringing this wine and this bad boy down, Luke 19, 37 to 40 is one of my, this smacked me in the face for this word today. It says, when he came to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they've seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory on the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd saw this. And they said, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if, I keep, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The stones will cry out. Everybody, I wrote this silly little poem, and I hope it gets in your, 
Our journeys have all been different. Our stories aren't the same. But build your altars along your path and declare his mighty name. I wrote that the other night because your story is different than my story. And here's the thing. Like I said, when we set up an altar, when we build an altar of remembrance for the things that the Lord has done, it just, it impregnates the air. And we ourselves can grab a hold of the things that the Lord has done and say, I have faith in you no matter what's in front of me right now. No matter this obstacle, no matter that my wife is in, in a hospital or no matter that somebody, there's an issue of a layoff or there's a divorce happening or a separate, I still have faith in you because you did this for me, you did this for me, you did this for me, and I know because I know because I know that you will keep, continue to provide for me and continue to be there for me because of all the stones I have set up in my life. Church, you can build your life into an altar of remembrance for all that the Lord has done. Altars aren't just for the Old Testament, they're for today. They look a little different. The altars of the Old Testament were stones. The altars of the New Testament might be called a joy journal. It might be called a blessings book. You can write down the Lord's glory on pages of a book called the pages of praise. And you can write these things down so you don't forget what the Lord has done for you. You can do anything, but most importantly, most importantly, you can say, Lord, who in my life do you want me to share this with? Who in my life will be encouraged by the way you've worked mightily? Who needs to hear this? And not only somebody who I know in my life, but bring somebody to me who needs this in their moment right now. Bring somebody to me who in my life at the doctor's office at Shoppers Drug Mart in the lineup waiting to pick up the kids. Bring somebody to me who needs this and I can encourage in you through this word. Church, altars are for today and I challenge each and every one of you. Actually, worship team, can I have you guys come back up, please? This song that they sang today was so good. I walked in this morning and I was just instantly in tears and that never happens. I want us to sing this song today, but I don't just want us to sing it. I want us to think of God's goodness. Think of the glory. And I know, you know what? If you sit there and you think about it long enough, you, maybe you're in here today and you're like, well, I'm brand new to this faith thing. Maybe, maybe I, you know, I don't really know of any big stories. Again, it doesn't have to be a big rock. It can be a little rock. But if you sit and you pay attention and you don't forget the ways the Lord has moved in your life, Draw attention to it as we worship and as we sing this song today. He is so good. He is so good. So proclaim it because the world needs to know who do you say that he is. I'm going to pray for us. Father God, I thank you for this word today, Lord. I just pray that it had an impact on hearts. Lord, I just thank you for this day and I thank you for these hungry, hungry believers in this church, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be up here. And Lord, I thank you for the way you have worked mightily in each and every person in this church's life. Lord, we say thank you. We give you all the glory. And we just, we just pray for a continued mighty hand, your continued hand of movement in our life, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. And right now we worship you for all that you've